Good evening. My name is uh, Fayaz Ahmed, and I'm a consultant neurologist in the northeast of England, in the east of Yorkshire. Today, I'm going to talk about the current and emerging treatment in patients with uh, chronic migraine. So let me share my screen with you. Okay, so um, these are my disclosures. And what we are going to learn in the next 30 minutes is um, what are chronic daily headaches because that's where the chronic migraine comes from. What are the other things that you must consider when you're seeing a patient with chronic migraine? What are the evidence-based current treatment for chronic migraine and what are the emerging treatments? I'll give you an overview of all of them. So this is one of my favorite slides, which actually give you a good breakup of all headache disorders. We have a primary headache disorder and we have a secondary headache disorder. When there is no underlying cause is found, we call them primary headache disorder, which could be either episodic, i.e. affecting for 15 or less than 15 days of headache per month, or chronic, which is 15 or more than 15 days of headaches per month. Now, the headaches are further classified into those that spontaneously resolve in less than four hours. And we are talking about cluster headache and some trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia in that. But when we talk about migraine, if untreated, they usually last for more than four hours. So they, we call them long lasting um, daily headaches. And chronic migraine actually falls in that category. And we would discuss about the other three that you would want to differentiated from chronic migraine. And I must emphasize that medication overuse is a problem that you can have with both uh, chronic migraine and other primary headache disorders. So what are chronic daily headaches? Uh, well, chronic daily headaches uh, are all headaches that are on 15 or more than 15 days a month for at least three months. Chronic daily headache is not a diagnosis, it's a syndrome. The most common cause of chronic daily headache is chronic migraine, although a few patients would have medication overuse and a few of them have both chronic migraine and medication overuse. There are some unusual causes for uh, chronic daily headache like new daily persistent headaches, hemicrania continua, chronic tension type headache, and obviously chronic cluster headache, which I put it in yellow because I'm not going to discuss that as they are short lasting headaches. So what is a chronic migraine? Well, if you have headaches on more than 15 days a month for at least three months, and about half of them fulfill the criteria for migraine with or without aura on at least eight days, which roughly said, uh, half of them, then you call it as a chronic migraine. So why chronic migraine is a separate entity and a very important entity? Well, a lot of uh, patients get underdiagnosed and a lot of people are not properly treated in spite of that this is one of the most disabling form of headache disorder. Many comorbidities, including back pain, depression, anxiety are fairly common in patients with chronic migraine. And the triggers that you read about for causing migraine are also more important and more pronounced with chronic migraine. In real life, 50 to 80% of patients would be overusing painkiller. And hence we suggest that those who are overusing painkiller doesn't mean that their headache is due to overuse of painkiller because painkiller overuse is a separate entity. 
and a headache caused by the overuse of painkillers. We know the patients with chronic migraine have a low pain threshold and a tendency to overuse painkillers anyway. Now, if you look at the number of people consulting for their migraines, this is a data from uh, all over the world. I would basically take the UK and four times more people with chronic migraine will seek consultation um, than patients with episodic migraine. And I think that's probably the same all over. Apart from Italy, where more people with episodic migraines are getting consultation, but then the model is different because in Italy, you have a neurologist or a headache specialist in every 10,000 of the population. Now, I'll just spend a minute or two on how you could exclude some other causes of chronic daily headache. So you talked about chronic migraine. Now, if the chronic daily headache is strictly unilateral, and particularly if they are associated with some autonomic features of lacrimation, rhinorrhea, or redness of the eye, you should think about um, hemicrania continua. And the reason behind it is, although it is rare, it has an absolute response to indomethacine. So a strictly unilateral chronic daily headache, you must think about giving them indomethacine, so as to see whether you are dealing with hemigrania continua or not. If the chronic daily headache have started on a particular day and the person tells you that it came on, say, on a Christmas day or the day that you got married or things like that, then you must say that this is a new daily persistent headache. Now, new daily persistent headache, most of them are actually chronic migraine, but the reason that we separate this entity is because this is an indication that you make sure that the patient doesn't have a secondary headache. So it's a requirement for investigation rather than anything else. So if you don't think they have got hemicrania continua, if it's a, not a definitive date of onset, then you're dealing with chronic migraine. Now you might have heard about chronic tension type headache, but I think if you are going to make a diagnosis of chronic tension type headache, treat it as chronic migraine because chronic tension type headache is very, very rare. It is very difficult to have a tension headache around the clock. I think it's more likely to be varying degrees of migraine that uh, cause the problem. This is another way of looking at it. So you have, you have a patient with chronic daily headache that fulfill the criteria for long-lasting headaches, strictly unilateral, give them endomethacine, it's hemicrania continua. If not, clear time of onset, that's a new daily persistent headache, investigate. If not, treat it as chronic migraine. And if you're not getting anywhere, just remotely one in a hundred times, you might be dealing with chronic tension type headache. So how would you manage chronic migraine? Well, the first thing is managing expectations. A lot of times your patients are unhappy because you have not got their expectations right. I tell the patient that there is no cure for migraine. The best we can do is to make your, your life manageable. So you are able to live your life fairly normally and um, you have a reasonable quality of life. In this way, they don't over expect anything and therefore uh, they are much more acceptable when their headache reduces to the required level. Often patients with migraine would like to know whether they have got a serious underlying cause. So reassurance sometimes go a long way to uh, treat their migraine. If you assure them that there is no brain tumor or serious underlying cause, then a lot of people would be happy. Some, however, still ask for a scan. And I think if you pick between the lines that that's the only thing that they are coming to consult you, there is no harm in doing a scan 
if it is therapeutic. Those who are taking treatment for their migraine, you have to empower them to make their own decision. I think in this modern era of internet, social media, the people would go and read about it anyway. So if you empower them and signpost them, then they can get most of the information themselves. You just guide them, but they are the one who manage. Lifestyle obviously is good for good living and the normal lifestyle of uh, balanced food, balanced diet, sleep on time, hydration, etc. also um, would help. And there is some role of cognitive behavior therapy in some cases. So how do you treat them acutely? So acute attacks of migraines, you can treat them in two ways. One way is to start with a simple painkiller paracetamol, then move on to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And then if they don't respond to that, you go on to tryptin. That's what we call a stratified approach. Or you evaluate their symptoms and give them the most appropriate treatment that you think is gonna benefit them. That's what we call a stepped approach. Or I think it's the other way around. So stepped approach is where you start with a simple painkiller and move on, um, <coughs> excuse me. And stratified is where you choose the treatment, appropriate treatment at the right, uh, from the very start. In any case, never use opioids. Any painkiller that has got codeine in it should never be used for treating migraine. If you're gonna use tryptin, then there are a few principles to remember. The lack of response to one tryptin does not mean that they would not respond to the other tryptin. But it doesn't mean that you use the tryptin once and change it. You give at least two or three attempts with one tri tryptin, and if it doesn't work, then you move to the other tryptin. Ask the patient to take it early in the headache, but not during the aura. And remember, there are one in three people that may not respond to any form of tryptin. So it's not a solution for everyone. This is something that I always tell people that if you are asking the patient to take a painkiller or a tryptin early in their migraine, then a lot of time they may be treating their headaches when they actually do not need the treatment because it might not add up to a very severe attack. And that opens the door for frequent medication intake and medication overuse. But on the other hand, if you wait till the attacks become moderate to severe, it may not work as effectively um, as it does other times. So there are arguments to both sides. What are the treatment options? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, this is alphabetical list of all the drugs that have got randomized controlled trial evidence. In the UK, we don't use much of aspirin. We use non-steroidal and the paracetamol. And this is roughly the start and the total dosage in 24 hours. So choose any one. They're all equally good. One is no better than the other. See here are the tryptin. And again, it, they are in the alphabetical order. Um, and there are a range of them. Obviously, the sumatriptan was the first to come. And then after that, we have had quite a few more uh, tryptan available. So these are all with the randomized controlled trial evidence. And you can use either of them as and when necessary. <coughs> Excuse me. So when do you use which tryptan? Well, if you go for number needed to treat, subcutaneous uh, tryptan six milligram is probably the best, but it's more expensive. So therefore, people with a uh, cost problem usually start with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or paracetamol, and then moves on to the tryptan. Now, if you want low side effects, then NARA 
Almo and Frova are the best. If you want a quick response within two hours, then Ali, Riza, and Almo are the best. So quick and low adverse is almotriptan. If you're looking for low recurrence, um, i.e. longer duration of action, so uh, Frovatriptan and Alitriptan are the best. So if you require a good response and no recurrence, you choose Alitriptan. So that's how you choose the triptan as such. Now, if you look at the number needed to treat, we have got the, on the very left, Sulma, Triptan, Subcutaneous, you only need two to treat one. And this goes on with various preparations and others on the extreme right is paracetamol, you need to treat 10 to get one. So uh, choose based on the number needed to treat or choose based on the duration of the attack, the severity of the attack or uh, whatever you would need um, the outcome for. So, um, the consensus view on the migraine prophylaxis is that if people have less than four days of headache per month, then usually they do not require um, any prophylactic treatment. If they have got between four to six days of uh, headaches per month, then you should consider preventative treatment. And if the requirement is uh, if, if the number of days affected uh, is more than six days, they should always uh, be given um, preventative treatment. If you do use preventative treatment, what are the basic principles? Well, the choice depends on the comorbidities, whether they have asthma, whether they have anxiety, whether they have got coexisting other medical problems whether it's a young female, whether they are seeking pregnancy, whether they are on oral contraceptive pill. So choose individually rather than a blanket uh, guideline. There are no or very few head-to-head -head studies between the uh, preventative treatment. Um, so therefore, uh, um, most of the data that you have it available is with the placebo. So there is nothing one has more than the other. Every drug has got their own merits and demerits. Whatever you start, build them up gradually over a period of few weeks and keep on the maximum dose, tolerable maximum dose for two to three months. And if uh, it's not effective, then consider about changing it. If it does work, you continue for six to 12 months and then maybe start withdrawing again and during this time, measure the quality of life, either through the HIT-6 score or migraine-specific questionnaire or MIDAS. So these are the various options available for prophylactic treatment. So you can see that we have got uh, a beta blocker, pizotifin, anti-epileptic drugs like uh, topiramate and apilim, um, tricyclic antidepressant, <coughs> Excuse me. Amitriptyline, ACE inhibitors like lysinopril, candisartan. There are others. So, Botox for chronic migraine. Uh, we got methicerguide, but it's not available anymore. Lunarazine is available in many countries, in some it is not. Then we have magnesium, riboflavin, coenzyme Q, greater octet nerve block. So, there, these are the various modalities that are available um, for, uh, for, for use. These are what we call the network meta-analysis in which we see that there are many studies comparing treatments with placebo and there are very few head-to-head -head studies. I think there is one with amitriptyline comparing to pyramid. There is one comparing to pyramid with propenrol. Most of the others are placebo uh, controlled. In this network meta-analysis, we can see that uh, those falling on the left of the line are effective in prevention. Those on the right are not. 
So we see that gabapentin and sodium valproate are not as good compared to the, the main drugs that are used is amitriptyline, the pyramate, or prenolol. Yeah. Now, if you chart them in a way, uh, you have to see which is number one in various studies or in various network meta-analysis. You find that um, the pyramate, propranolol, and amitriptyline are the top three drugs to be number one um, in, in um, or number one or number two in prevention. While the placebo, which is obviously the dull one, is uh, likely to be more likely to be number eight and least likely to be number one. So that's how you choose which are got a better evidence and which have not got a better evidence. So this is the BASH guidelines. Um, these are the one which BASH recommends. Uh, amitriptyline, candesartan, propranolol, and topiramid. These four can be used for both episodic and chronic migraine. And then you have Botox, which can use for the chronic migraine. They are in the alphabetical order and Botox is purely for chronic migraine. And this is what we would recommend people to use as a first line treatment. Obviously, if that doesn't work, then you can go on to the second and third line treatment, which I have shown you in the initial chart. If uh, <clears throat> oral treatments you have tried does not work, you can give patients a greater occipital nerve block which is basically injecting a small dose of steroid and local anesthetic in the uh, greater and lesser occipital nerve. And there are some variable uh, results from four small randomized controlled trial, but it's worth an effort, particularly when there has been an exacerbation of migraine or a status migraine also. Botox, obviously, we, we use it here in the UK in a different way. I don't know how you use it in, uh, in um, UAE, but we give two cycles three months apart. And if there is 30% uh, improvement in headache days or migraine days or um, increase in the clear days, then we continue, otherwise we stop. And we continue until um, the number of headache days or migraine days have come down to single figures. I usually continue until the number of days of headache are less than 10 days per month because of the high degree of relapse. If you give it maybe 10 to 15 days per month. There are some treatments with limited recommendation, but obviously they are available. One of them is a gadget called single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulation. It basically gives you a magnetic wave on the back of the head that travels through your brain in a nicer way, disturbs the brain in a nicer way and stop the uh, uh, migraine during the aura. It is a small device that fits in women's handbag. You can carry it around. You give yourself a little buzz and often it works. It's expensive, cost about 100 to 200 pound a month. So, um, but you can order it, it's available from e in America. The second gadget is what we call Gamma Core. So the Gamma Core device is something that you put on the right side of your neck to stimulate the vagus nerve. Most of the trials done for Gamma Core um, show some benefit, but its main positive results are seen in patients with cluster headache. So it's more effective in cluster headache, but obviously can be in uh, migraine. So one of the acute migraine study was Presto, and it didn't reach the primary endpoint of a good result at two hours, but 60 minute results were, were, were better. So I think if you're clutching the straw, there isn't any harm in using um, gamma core. There is some uh, evidence in one of the pilot study that um, uh, gamma core could potentially have a preventive effect in chronic migraine. The other gadget is cephaly. 
it's less expensive than the gamma core and uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. You can order it through the Amazon. There is uh, big data from uh, Schoenen Group in Belgium, and it is like wearing glasses on your forehead, and it does work. Um, in some cases, so worth a try. I think it cost about 150 pounds to 250 pounds to buy it as such. And that's something that has uh, not come in the market yet. It's called Relivion. And um, that should soon be available. And this is a like, like a multiple cranial nerve block. So you have got some um, electrodes on the front some on the side and some on the back. So it actually would stimulate all the nerves that we usually inject with Botox in an electrical way. And in absolutely refractory cases, when you are completely disappointed, you could give them IV infusion of dihydroergotamine. Even in the UK, a lot of centers don't have that facility. And um, people get an infusion of IV DHE for every day for five days, and that's worth uh, breaking the cycle of resistance to existing preventive treatment. And then obviously we have got these new CGRP monoclonal antibodies um, that you've heard of. We have got actinizumab from Alder, which is not available yet, still in the trial stage. We got uh, Amovit from Novartis, Amgen, Gelcanizumab or Angality, from Lilly and a Jovi from Teva, Rimazinamab. Three of them work against the CGRP ligand and one against the receptor. And they're all subcutaneous injections um, every four weeks, and the actinizumab is an infusion every 12 weeks. At the moment, we are using Amovig. Uh, we soon start to, uh, at, the, at the moment, we are using both Amovig and a Jovi, and we would soon start with the Mgality or Galcanizumab. The thing to see, and I'm sorry the slide is not clear to you, but if you look at the 50% responder rate, uh, comparing the CGRP versus the current treatment, you find that this is topiramate on your right, and you have a 10% gain. Botox, you have a 12% gain. Galcanizumab, you have a 12% gain. You had 23% gain with Ajovi or Frimazinumab, 17% gain with Arinumab, and about 16% gain in Aptinizumab. So compared to, they are all comparable with the, with the current treatment. So that's quite good actually. But the main thing is the discontinuation rate. Look at the topiramate. One third of the people you give topiramate want to come off because of the side effect. Now look at the, the MABs, the erinumab, primazinumab, and the Botox. The discontinuation rate is about 2 to 3 percent, about 1.8 percent. That means the tolerability of these new drugs is very high. So what is on the way? Well, Ditons is uh, a treatment that should be arriving fairly soon. It is available in the United States. So basically, the triptans are 5-HT1, B, and D action, and therefore have coronary side effect. Lasmiditan has got a 5-HT1F action, mainly in the trigeminal, nowhere else. So people who can't have triptans because of ischemic heart disease should be able to have this comfortably, and there will not be a contraindication. And the good thing is, if you look at the therapeutic gain, it's very similar to tryptin. So it's as good as tryptin without any contraindication. The next arrival would be the G pent. And uh, the uh, Rimi G pent and Ubro G pent are available in the United States. The Ubro G pent is an uh, acute study, so used as an acute treatment. Remedipent is both acute and preventive, and etogipent is preventive treatment. So etogipent, the trials are still ongoing. Um, the other one have got some data available. And if you see the therapeutic gain is not as good 
as tryptin. So although they should give an, an added option of treatment, if therapeutic gain for either of them is not as impressive as it is with the less meditan. So the conclusion is the chronic migraine is the most common form of chronic daily headache. A large number of people with chronic migraine have a medication overuse problem. But if you get rid of the chronic migraine, you get rid of the medication overuse. I would suggest that you choose the best acute treatment from the very start called a stratified approach. And choose a prophylactic treatment based on the individual needs rather than a blanket guideline. I think the CGRP monoclonal antibody will rule the world the next 10 years. And I must tell you that we have got uh, webinars on platform of British Association for the Study of Headache, which occurs on the last Wednesday of every month at 7 p.m. UK time. Uh, there is no joining or registration fee. And uh, um, if you send me an email, um, then I can add you to the, uh, to the inviting list. And uh, it will be nice to see you there. Thank you very much.